Good afternoon and welcome to the ME7 podcast and the first edition of Mental Health Monthly. As you can see, I'm joined by Tom and Nigel. Um, gents, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Thank Firstly, thank you for joining me. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Tom, you come forward, well, you both come forward, but but Tom, you, you come forward pretty much straight away after he announced it on the yeah, live yeah. show that you wanted to come come and do this. Yeah. Um, I suppose we'll start with you then. Why Why did you, when we first mentioned we were doing it, why, why did you want to come on and speak? I just think that there's a, obviously a massive stigma um, around mental health and in particularly men's mental health. Um, maybe it's, it is getting better as time goes on, um, but I do think it's something that you shouldn't be afraid to open up and talk about. I think you need to be able to talk to it. I like to think I know quite a lot of people that go to Jill's um, so maybe if they saw me talking about it, they might feel more open about talking problems they may have if they haven't discussed them with anyone already, really. Yeah. What about you, Nigel? Yeah, I'm pretty much the same, you know. Um, sitting there, bottling things up, you know, not talking about it, you know, it, it doesn't do anyone any good. And I, I think if, if people can talk about it, particularly men, a little bit more, and, and you can help just one person, you know, you, you're doing something good, giving something back, you know what I mean? Yeah. Bang on the money. Tom, we'll start with you then. Um, yeah, let's start sort of back at the beginning of your of your Jill's, um, <laughs> your, your, your Jill's supporting life. Where did it, where so, did it hold you? How did you get into it? But back when I was, I don't know how old I was, my first game, um, maybe eight or nine, maybe. Um, my dad was a season ticket holder at Jill's from about 1980. Um, so I'd always gone. Um, obviously, when we was of an age, probably not to annoy him for 90 minutes on a Saturday, he uh, obviously took us along. And then ever since then, to be fair, for, for 10 or 15 years, it was quite sporadic. Always made at least one or two games a season um, due to work commitments and stuff. But in the last four years, I mean, I, I could count on two hours the amount of games we probably missed our man away. <laughs> so, yeah, all, all, all to do with the old man taking me all them years ago, mate, really. Never looked back. Never look back. Yeah, that's a, that is the saying, though, isn't it? Never, never look back, Jill. Never yeah. look back. There you go. Go on, go on, go on nice. What, what about you, mate? Um, it was 94 95 season. Um, bit of a glory hunt, to be honest. You know, we'd drawn Sheffield Wednesday at home in the FA Cup, and uh, Chris Waddle was playing for Sheffield Wednesday. And uh, following Spurs, yes, I don't do football easy, um, but following Spurs at the time, I, I wanted to see Chris Waddle, you know, and uh. I went to that and then went to the last home game that season, a nil-nil draw against Hereford, uh, sat on the terraces, and I just thought, this this feels right, you know, this is something I want to do. So from there on, went to the entire pre-season after and just never stopped, never stopped. I think what's quite interesting is that both of you sort of immediately felt at home. Yeah, um, 100%. That is the best way... To be fair, James, that's bang on the button. That is how I would describe it. It's a comfortable place to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, isn't it? Is that we've 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 seen this season certainly the certainly the fan base. I think for me, certainly since I've been going, the fan base seem a little bit what split. I think that's fair to say in yeah. terms of how close we are. Yeah. I, I think if certainly I've been going, I've been going over twenty mm-hmm. years now, and and I've always felt that Jill's is a is a family club. You yeah, totally. literally walk down the road, down Redburn Avenue, and you see about twenty to thirty people yeah. you know before Every you've time. even walked before you've even walked through the turnstile. Is that do you think that's what pulls you in, Tom? That 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 family feel that everybody knows everybody. We're all one. Yeah, totally. Like, you know, you're a bit closer than, than us, James, to the actual club itself, but even maybe to say that it feels like you're part of something. And I don't just mean that in terms of when Brad and Shannon took over, I'm, I'm going way back when. I just think for a lot of people, it's it's nice to feel part of something. And when you see the same people week in, week out, you know, it's nice to shake hands, say, how was your week? How are you? People do enjoy that. And I think for me, that's definitely a massive part of it. Like, you know, the guys that sit around me and the Rainer men, listen, they're fantastic. Like, I, I would class them as friends now, like, and, and seeing them every weekend is as great for me as it is going to watch the Jills, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. 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 I mean, Nigel, you, you sit like obviously directly behind me. Is that is that sort of a similar thing for you? Is it, it's not only 
just the football it's the it's the social element of it as well oh yeah i mean um i've i've, I've met so many people that I've, I've become friends with over the years you know um I, I, now I go down like the, the the pub beforehand, you know, have a couple of beers with a few lads that I used to set up the town in with. You know, we just instantly click, got talking, and and we become really good mates. You know, and then you, you, the likes of yourself and and other people, you just get to know faces. They get to know you, and, and you just you just chat and you get along, and 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 yeah, it just feels like you know everybody's become part of your family. You know, hundred percent. Um. Right, let's get to let's get to the sort of part that I guess is important that we obviously speak about what's happened to us, what we've been yeah. through before, and, and 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 sort of I guess while we're here, we'll, we'll start with you, Tom. Um, I know I know obviously what yeah, of course, you, yeah, you, what you've what you've gone through and whatever else, but yeah, if you if you just want to yeah, of course, you know. what what you what yeah, what basically you've gone through in terms of your mental health, definitely. Yeah, so. Obviously, I mentioned before, like, I used to go to football with my dad, you know, every weekend, every, you know, most boys probably say dad, dad's one of your closest friends. And in August of 2022, my dad suddenly passed away. Um, he had pneumonia, was in hospital for a couple of weeks, was let out, was home for a week. Um, and then the following Friday, I had a cardiac arrest at home and passed away. Totally out of the blue, day before his 62nd birthday. Um, I'm in a warehouse shifting parcels, just completely out of the blue no one expected it and you know in in terms of a of a mental health perspective you you know i was certainly one of them people that sat there and thought that will never be me like i'm i'm mentally strong enough I, I, it won't affect me and you know for for the short while after it when all the commotions going on and funerals and stuff you know your mind's distracted and all of a sudden in january of last year so 2023 just hit me like a freight train um I was, I was all over the place. I was having breakdowns. I was stood in the garden at night being sick. I was in hospital with blood pressure readings of 200 over 110, which wow. by the way is very dangerous. Yeah. Um, and physically, absolutely nothing wrong with me. Um, all, all mental and all, all based on, you know, that, that incident. Um, obviously, in the end, diagnosed with anxiety, a little bit of depression, Little bit of PTSD. Um, not, not. I'm not saying it was severe PTSD, but that, that's what the doctors told me. Um, and you know, w w was given was given the pills that you think. Well, I'm never going to take a pill pill for my mental health. What's that about? You know, I'm a bloke. That don't happen. But definitely, definitely uh, did need them. Definitely a lot better now. 18 months down the line. But for me personally, it's just when, when it comes to mental health. You know, we, we all get bad moods and things like that. But it, it was the physical side effects that I personally experienced that you didn't realise your brain could probably cause. Um, and I would hate for somebody else to be sat at home feeling the way I felt in them days. And I, I didn't say anything to 21 for a long time, James. And then it was just too apparent, you know, like I'd be laying in bed at night and my partner would be like, what, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? And eventually I couraged up to go to the doctors. It, it wasn't a case of not wanting to go. I didn't have didn't have the bollocks or <laughs> to go if I'm honest with you. So but my one strongest piece of advice for anyone out there, like go and speak to someone. And you know, in ter in terms of the in terms of the football club, if anyone sees me there on a Saturday afternoon uh, and you need to talk, do not not come up to me. I I will sit and listen 100 percent Because if I hadn't gone to the doctors that day and, and hadn't seen the nurses and stuff in hospital and people hadn't listened to me, I'm not for one minute saying the worst would have come, but I can't tell you what would have happened because I felt that bad, if that makes sense. Wow, yeah. Mate, I want to give you a round of applause. That was absolutely brilliant. Honestly, credit to you. Credit to you for, for getting through it. Um, yeah. I, know how, I, I know how hard it is. I know, I know yeah, exactly I, I, what you've been through. Yeah. So, yeah, hundred, hundred, bang on the money. I will come back to you and, and yeah, yeah, ask course, you yeah. more questions, but yeah, Nigel, go on, go on, mate. What? Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've, um, I've now been diagnosed uh, on three separate occasions with uh, clinical clinical depression. Um, but the, the first time was was probably you know the biggest deal. Um, it was two thousand and nine, um, 
and my my kids were six and coming up to seven months and my wife got really ill uh she ended up with uh what was it well she ended up with um i can't remember the name of it now anyway she she ended up really ill in hospital um and she almost died and i was my, my, my day would consist of because because work were great you know they, they 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 changed my shift so i could be on an early shift but i'd get up at like half four in the morning to sort my youngest out get me eldest ready for school my mum would come over you know i'd go to work i'd come home from work i'd go up to visit the wife um see the wife in the state she was um come home feed the kids sort the kids out and then sit down and literally have half an hour to myself before i had to go to bed no time to unwind and it it, it, it drove me into the ground it, it literally drove me to a point where one night i was sitting there changing my youngest daughter and my eldest daughter said to me dad why are you crying i said i'm not cr i'm not crying you know i'm not crying and I touched my face and realized that I, I had tears streaming down my face, you know, and I just, I, fe I felt weak because I felt like um, I'd always been in control of everything. And at this point I could, I could no longer control the things around me. You know, everything's rushing by a thousand miles an hour. And I felt like I was running through tar, you know, and I thought I was the problem. And it, one point i thought maybe the best thing to do was remove myself from the situation i was the problem you know i couldn't couldn't handle it couldn't cope and if it hadn't been for my my eldest at that moment i think uh i think my things might have been a lot different put it that way yeah. thanks mate honestly but yeah please <clears throat> please I, I think tom will tom will definitely say it say this and, and other people listening is that hundred percent no way were you the problem and, and i'm sure that you did an absolute fantastic job bringing up bringing up those children as, as you've done mate so yeah, um, definitely, definitely yeah tom i think i want to come back to you is that you mentioned about um you felt that you'd left it a little bit too long in terms of speak but you ended up speaking to the doctors yeah. do you think that's what do you think things like this and 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 cancelling and everything else and and certainly you mentioned about the stigma in certainly men's mental health and football yeah. do you think it, it it does need to be spoken about much more than it it is oh. done because of things like you've gone through yeah joe million percent you know i actually watched a thing the other day and uh it was just one of the little TikTok reels or instagram videos and it said at a father's funeral, the strongest person has to be the eldest son. But at the end of the funeral, what then happens to the eldest son? Well, that is me. So, you know, when I look back at that day, I'm there shaking everyone's hands, making sure everyone's all right. Obviously, my stepmom's in bits, my brothers are in bits. And I I wasn't. Whether, you know, I like to think that was my old man maybe telling me, come on, get on with it. Do you know what I mean? It's you, it's you now. But certainly i tried to block it out for them reasons thinking like i'm the i'm, I'm the strong man like it's not going to bother me and honestly within the space of a week in january i was i was broken you know i was laying in bed at night shaking being sick like i said james trips to hospital absolutely just couldn't sit still i was completely destroyed and that is because definitely i blocked it out um and like I say, mate, if I hadn't gone to the doctors that that Tuesday, I went to the doctors. Like Nigel said a minute ago, what the outcome would have been, who, who knows? So the definite biggest message from me is talk to someone and, and talk to anybody because I've always found that when you talk about it, even to anybody in a conversation in the pub, the instant feeling you get after talking about it is not relief as such, but you do instantly feel slightly better the moment you can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, but yeah. If you want to, if you just want to carry that on in terms of the same same sort of topic about about yeah about speaking about it about. Yeah, I mean, the same situation as Tom. Really, you know, I'm, I'm six foot three. You know, I, I weigh sixteen stone. I'm by in, in all all intents and purposes, I'm a giant. I I should as that kind of person be able to smash down walls, you know, and 
that that feeling of you know not not being in control you know and the the, the first person I, I think i actually spoke to about it was actually my, my, my dad's partner on the phone and she's quite level-headed and um she said that just just speak to someone phone someone up and it took it took a few days you know um but i picked that phone up speak to the doctor and as, as tom says you know the, the, the first step of actually telling someone you know saying saying those first words look i need help it's the biggest it's the hardest yeah. but once it's done you know the walls start falling away yeah, totally. you know you, you start you start releasing little bits of neg negativity straight away it's gone you know you, you start to feel like okay maybe i'm not the problem maybe there is a way out maybe i can find something you know and, and talking to people you, you, you soon find that there's a lot of people that go through the same kind of things maybe not not the same as you because each person's the situation is, is individually different but you know there's there's certain emotions certain feelings that you can talk to people about and they'll say you know okay I, i've done this maybe um try this try that you know not everything works for everybody but you start getting ideas and just little bits of support yeah, you know totally. just just not disconnecting yourself from the world is is probably the, the 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 biggest advice i would give anyone you know it's a perfect time to start maybe thinking about something you wanted to do you know a hobby or something you know we maybe where you just get out and see people talk to people or you know just get a bit of time for yourself space to breathe you know because it's, it's it's claustrophobic the whole feeling just feels claustrophobic it feels like you're choking on your own air yeah. you know and taking that first step and taking the first deep breath it is the biggest biggest step you'll ever make yeah i totally agree with that nice to be fair Thanks yeah money, um you you mentioned about seeing people and things like that i think yeah i whenever i've because I've, I've been diagnosed with depression obviously after losing my dad but yeah the biggest thing for me was that jules was as, as crap as they as they as they can be um they've always been my outlet yeah um how how do you feel that jules i, I suppose the jules family because that's what we are with with the jules family how we'll start with you tom how did the jules family get you through and, and has got you through what you've what you've gone through i think in terms of like anyone personally um probably not and I, i'm not saying that in a bad way but i think that reverts back to like the first the first bit of the conversation in terms of it just feeling like a comfortable place to go i know for a fact for me when when i was going through that period when i wasn't very well at least when i when we was at home on a saturday that I could almost guarantee on that Saturday I wouldn't have an anxiety issue. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had a funny turn. I wouldn't have felt uneasy. I wouldn't have, you know, felt depressive or, or anything like that because and that's the reason why I call it comfortable. Because all the other places I would be at in the world during the working week, and all of a sudden I went to Priestfield on a Saturday and I felt comfortable. And like you mentioned, I think that's just the surroundings, James, if I'm brutally honest. Yeah. What about you, Nice? Um, for me, it was, uh, you know, because I, I, I didn't want, you know, to, to initially I didn't want to interact with the world, you know, I just wanted to keep myself locked away. But having, um, because it, ha it happened during the middle of a season, so having those days where I knew I was going to, I wasn't going to miss football, you know, having those days where I knew I was going to effectively force myself to get out of the house, you know, take that walk along Priestfield, yeah, you know, have a breather, go and see people and just, again, interact with the world. It, it, that, that's where it was important, you know, is having that, that kind of, it was that one piece of uh, regularity, that stability, you know, it was, it was a constant, you know, and, I, mean, I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> the problem was it wasn't the greatest of seasons we had. I mean, it was, it was the 0-9-10 season where we didn't win a single away game. So, you know, and but that that's actually where I started growing my beard as well because um, 
and, and disbelieve it or not helped because I, I refused to refuse to shave my beard until Gillingham won away. And we wow, didn't win away that season. season. But people were talking to me saying, oh, well, the, 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 about talking about the beard, why I'm doing it. And, and it's, it's strange little things like that, you know, the little things that you don't notice at the time. And yeah. it, it all come from Gillingham, obviously being so bad but at, at the time. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it all come from having that, that stability, that regularity, you know, that, that, that helped immensely. Right. So before we, before we finish, um, we're going we're gonna to start a little thing off where obviously we're going to do one of these a month with different people and we're going to start a little thing off and you guys are going to be the first thing first ones to do it you can either pick a question or a piece of advice that i will then read out to the next two people that we have on next month so it's either a question that you want to ask them and then i'll i'll then ask them it or it's a just a piece of advice and i will basically say right okay this advice has come from tom or it's come from Nigel, and that will be passed on to him on the recording next month. So, Tom, if you want to start, it, it can be either a question or a piece of advice, whatever you I'm want to say, mate. I'll go with a piece of advice, and I think it's probably obviously the most well-rounded one. We've all mentioned it a few times in this conversation, but my advice to anybody is speak to someone. And, and I just want to put it out there for, you know, whoever does watch this, whoever does listen to it, if you see me and you are in the moment we've all described – and I'm at the game, do not think you cannot talk to me because you will have my time. Love that. Brilliant. Go on, Nigel. What about you, mate? Um, my, I, I like to go with a piece of advice as well. And, and it, it's, not some, it's not just to the people that are struggling, but it's to, it's to everybody, you know. Um, we all know each other. We all, you, we all got friends. We've got family. If, if you see them on a regular basis and you, you know, you know them well and they suddenly don't seem right. Something's off, you know, and it's carried on for a while. Talk to them, mm. ask them the question, you know, they may, they may tell you where to go, but you may, as a person, you may be the trigger that helps them find what they need or even potentially nip something in the bud, you know, before it, it gets to a point where they're alone and they can't cope anymore. So just, just look out for each other. Yeah, I like that. A lot perfect. of times, though. Yeah, I think that's a perfect way to round it off. Tom, Nigel, you, I think, I think it's fair to say, considering this is the first one, first ever one we've done, you've both been absolutely outstanding this afternoon. Thank you so much for, Cheers, James. Thank for, for opening up and, and, and telling your story because you don't have to. Um, but, yeah. What I will say is that both of you, I'm sure, has definitely helped at least one person in their journey to, to either recovery or, or getting better or whatever else. And what I will say is, um, yeah, from, from us at the podcast as well, please, like Tom said, like Nigel said, definitely don't be afraid to talk. If you see one of us, if you see me or see Owen and, and Tom or Nigel or anyone at the, at the ground, I'm sure one of us will be more than happy to give you our time. Just even if it's hi how, how are you hello have a beer have a coffee together whatever else the door is always open so um yeah nice way to round it off thank you both so much for for, um, for joining me so cheers james next. thank you mate and, um, cheers james cheers tom mate cheers yeah, nice, nice one. Um, yeah you've been watching uh mental health monthly first edition with the me 7 podcast